M S W Media. This episode of Daily Beans is sponsored by Lumi, a doctor developed skin safe, pH balanced, and aluminum free deodorant. New customers get $5 off a Lumi starter pack with codes Daily Beans at LumiDeodorant.com. That equates to over 40% off your starter pack when you visit LumiDeodorant.com and use code Daily Beans. Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Friday, April 21st, 2023. Today, Boris Epstein talks to investigators in the special counsel's office. Mike Lindell loses a $5 million arbitration case. The judge in the E. Jean Carroll case responds to Takapina's request for jury instructions about Donald's potential absence. A top Republican lawyer is caught on audio decrying the youth vote. A GOP leader who voted to expel the Tennessee Three has resigned after sexual harassment allegations. The charges against Alec Baldwin have been dropped, and the Proud Boys' seditious conspiracy trial is wrapping up. I'm Allison Gill. And I'm Dana Goldberg. Hello, Dana. Happy Friday. Happy Friday to you. We got through the week. I'm so Ooh. sleepy. I don't know if we... anyone else is sleepy. I'm sleepy. <laughs> we did it. We had an interesting day over on Twitter. We got our blue check marks removed today. We did. And then I started looking at all the accounts that still have theirs. And now it feels like the blue check, with some exceptions, is like the new MAGA hat. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there are some uh, of our you know fellow resistors and independent journalists who have to have the blue check because their whole gig is... Uh, you know, long form video like I am politics girl and Lauren Windsor. Totally. So always, you know, make sure not to like block them or anything if that's what you're going to do. But I, we also found out that Le- LeBron James and Stephen King still have their blue check marks, even though they don't pay. And Elon Musk has admitted basically he's trolling them and paying for their check marks to stay up. Also, <laughs> interesting. I know he's nine. OK. So what I realized, and if you're a legacy blue and I think you are, check your, uh, go to your um, analytics and check your reach, right? Your impressions. Because in the months leading up to April 1st, remember April 1st is when he was originally going to take our check marks away? Right. And I think he couldn't figure out how to do it technology wise without having to one by one go and remove them. And so in the, a couple months leading up to April 1st, um, so like February and March, my reach, my Twitter impressions went from like 240 million down to like 110 million, like by half. Wow. So he was throttling us. But then I guess on April 1st, he found out that in order to hide our blue check marks, he can't throttle us. He had to identify us or something um, and put us back, like give us all of the benefits of a blue check mark again, because my impressions are back up to 240 million. Interesting. But my check mark is gone. However, I still we still appear in the verified tab. And if you search for verified accounts on Twitter, you know, search uh, like verified, we still pop up. Wow. OK, interesting. So I think the only thing he could figure out to do was to give us all of our benefits back and just mask the blue check mark, just physically, visually hide it. So <laughs> hmm. so that's I think what happened today. And so, yeah. Lost my blue check. But also today I was followed by James Gunn, which is fucking cool. And uh, I've been chatting with Ben Fold. It's like it's been a great day on Twitter for me. My blue check's gone, too. So but it is what it is. Yeah, it it is. And I am, you know, I'm over on post and spoutable and whatever. Where are you? Would have you gone elsewhere yet? I've been so bad. I haven't done. I mean, I, I'm on post, but I haven't actually done anything over there. I need to join Spatable. I haven't I haven't backed up any of my social media stuff. Um, so but you can definitely if you're listening to this, um, follow me on Instagram. I'm still over there at DG Comedy. I've been posting more videos there and I'll post my shows. Um, obviously, not as much political ranting in word, but definitely in video. So if you're on Instagram, it's a good place to follow there. Yes. Insta IG. Um, we are also there. And uh, I'm I'm still at Muller, she wrote on post uh, all the other things. I'm Wonderful. the same name. Um, also, uh, Boris Epstein today, today, um, which is Thursday for because people are going to be listening to this on Friday, was talking to special counsel. We don't have 
or the special counsel's office, investigators in the special counsel's office. We don't have any details yet. We don't know what he was being asked about. We don't know why he was there. We don't know how long he was there, but he was there today. So we'll get more information as we learn it. And also the rest of the charges against Alec Baldwin have been dropped. You'll remember back in February, they dropped the gun enhancement charge. Mm-hmm. Well, to, Today, they dropped the rest of the charges, the negligent, the two negligent homicide charges. Uh, David Halls uh, has already been sentenced in this to six months of probation. And, and Gutierrez Reed, who was the armorer on set, is still on the hook, still facing these charges. So, But they dropped them against um, Alec Baldwin. They also have not said why. Um, but, you know, we know that a, a Republican special prosecutor was put in charge of investigating this. So mm-hmm. uh, and we thought that the charges were a little overblown, but uh, I didn't know that they were going to just completely drop them. So but that happened. And the Proud Boys trial is finally wrapping up. It's been going on for forever. It seems like feels like it. Yeah. So there's just conspiracy. So they talked to they had Dominic Pozzola on the stand today and he was just a dick. He was like a combative asshole, which probably looks really bad for him. The Proud Boys. Fine. Fine by me. Yep. Um, but they they didn't bring any other witnesses up. And I think they're about to give their closing arguments and uh, we should get this to the jury uh, pretty soon. We'll see how that goes. Absolutely. And later in the show today, I'm going to be talking with Garrett Graff. He's CNN uh, analyst and, and historian, host of the new limited series podcast called Long Shadow Rise of the American Far Right. It's available now wherever you get your podcasts. I'm looking forward to that discussion. Wonderful. All right. We have a lot of news to get to today besides all that. So let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. All right. Yesterday, Dana, remember we talked about Joey Taco Pants? I do. And his letter to Judge Kaplan in the E. Jean Carroll case and how he was asking the judge to instruct the jurors to not draw negative inferences over the fact that Donald might not be there in person. Right. He wasn't trying to argue Nobody was trying to argue that he had to be there or not. It was more like the judge said, tell me when you're coming so we can set up the logistics. And he wrote it and said, well, could you instruct the jurors not to hold it against him if he doesn't show up in person? And we also read parts of Eugene's lawyer, Robbie Kaplan's response, which basically said, hey, he doesn't have to appear, but that's on him and the jury should be able to draw whatever inferences, inferences they want. Absolutely. Well, judge responded today, and I've got the letter here. Um, (laughs) Mr. Trump's lead counsel expresses Mr. Trump's alleged desire to testify at trial, but seeks an order from the court uh, excusing his presence unless either party calls him as a witness and, in the event he doesn't testify, instructing the jury that his absence by design avoids the logistical burdens of his presence as the former president, and it would cause the uh, courthouse in New York City. So. That's all the ask was, right? And to also, by the way, excuse the absence, which they don't have to do. First, the court neither excuses nor declines to excuse Mr. Trump from attending the trial or from testifying in the case. As far as this court is aware, Mr. Trump is under no legal obligation to be present or to testify. The plaintiff has made clear that she does not intend to call him as a witness. The decision whether to attend or to testify is his alone to make. There's nothing this court, there's nothing for this court to excuse. Second, the court notes, but does not accept Trump's counsel's claims concerning alleged burdens on the courthouse. (laughs) Mr. (laughs) Trump is entitled uh, by law to the protection of the United States Secret Service, which he has enjoyed as a former president for more than two years now. He has a right to testify uh, as it would for any person with a business before the court. The court will do everything within its power to ensure his safety. Moreover, it's entirely confident that the United States Marshal Service, City of New York, will do their parts. And moreover, the court notes um, Mr. Trump's campaign website and media reports that he announced earlier this week that he will speak at a campaign event in New Hampshire on April 27th, 2023, the third day of the scheduled trial in the case. If the Secret Service can protect him at that event, certainly they can do it here. Finally, Trump has been on notice (laughs) since uh, the April 25th trial date in this case since on or about February 7th. There has been quite ample time within which to make whatever logistical arrangements need to be made. Uh, The question of the requested jury instruction is premature. Mr. Trump is free to attend, to testify or both. He's free uh, to do none of those things. Uh, Should he elect not to appear or testify, his counsel may renew the request. But in the meantime, there shall be no reference by counsel for Mr. Trump in the presence of the jury 
or the trial jury to Mr. Trump's alleged desire to testify or the burdens that any absence on his part might allegedly spare or might have spared the court or the city of New York. So ordered. <laughs> Lewis so Kaplan. good. So good. It is. It is. Now, of course, um, <laughs> Takapina has responded to the court's previous request about tell us when you'll be here so we can set shit up. Right. Uh, and Joey Taco Pants says, hey, we write in response to your request. Uh, it was more of an order that we advise whether our client Trump intends to be present throughout the trial. But the decision of the defendant who is not required to appear as a civil litigant will be made during the course of the trial. We are not yet in a position to advise the court in this regard. However, we will inform the court as soon as a decision is reached, <laughs> particularly in light of the logistical concerns that will need to be addressed in coordination with Secret Service, the Marshal Service in the city of New York. <laughs> so uh, we don't have a response yet to this from the judge, but I seriously doubt the judge, whose patience is wearing thin, by the way, will take too kindly to this vague pile of shit. Especially because he just stated clearly it's not going to be an issue. We're going to make sure he's safe and everything's <laughs> taken care of. And they're like, OK, but we're going to make a decision based on whether or not he's safe and taken care of. <laughs> mm-hmm. Just ridiculous. Oh, man. All right. We're moving to other GOP parts. This is a member of the GOP leadership in Tennessee. The Tennessee House of Representatives uh, was recently found guilty. A member was recently found guilty of sexual harassing at least one legislative intern, likely two by an ethics subcommittee acting in secret. And this is from News Channel 5, their investigate, their investigative team. That's what they've learned. Mm. Now, about six hours after being confronted by News Channel 5 investigates, Rep. Scotty Campbell, okay, gave up a seat in the Tennessee Generally Assemble. Well, until now, Campbell, who served as vice chair of the House Republican Caucus and who recently voted to expel three Democrats who engaged in a gun violence protest on the House floor, had suffered no previous consequences as a result of his actions. Despite accusations of sometimes extremely vulgar comments and other inappropriate advances, Republicans did not remove the 39-year-old East Tennessee lawmaker from his leadership position nor from his committee assignments. Not surprising at all. But the taxpayers are paying for his actions. Okay? News Channel 5 has learned that potentially thousands of dollars have been spent to protect one victim relocating her from the downtown apartment building where she and Campbell both had apartments, shipping her furniture back home in another part of the state and placing her in a downtown hotel for the remainder of her internship. Legislative officials refuse to say how much they've paid out, saying that information is confidential. While confronted with allegations Thursday as he headed to Capitol Hill, Campbell referenced a second intern who was also involved in the investigation. Investigation. News Channel 5 was previously unaware that the individual's com- plaint even existed. This is a quote. I had consensual adult conversations with two adults off property. This is what he said. Okay. And I want to say, I think conversations are consensual once that is verbally agreed to. If I choose to talk to any intern in the future, it will be recorded. Okay. That's probably also illegal. (laughs) Yeah, I know. But a four member ethics subcommittee composed of two Republicans and two Democrats, well, they came to a different conclusion, according to a memorandum dated March 29th that was sent to House Speaker Cameron Sexton. Now, this is a quote based on the completed staff investigation. The ethics subcommittee finds that Representative Campbell violated the policy. Again, two Republicans, two Democrats violated the policy against workplace discrimination and harassment. That's what the memo says. Under the Tennessee General Assembly's own rules, however, quietly placing that vaguely worded memo in a representative's personal file is the only action that the ethics subcommittee can take upon a finding that has, um, excuse me, that he has engaged in improper conduct. So right now, that's all they can do with it. Well, ethics subcommittee members are also barred from publicly discussing their proceedings. Tennessee lawmakers have faced repeated criticism over the years for what some see as a a lax approach, if you will, to sexual harassment and discrimination. And that's exactly what it looks like. In April of 2019, Rep. Rick Staples, who's a Democrat from Knoxville, well, he was found guilty by the Ethics Subcommittee of engaging in sexual harassment after an unnamed woman said he, quote, grabbed and held onto her waist while standing behind her after he made inappropriate comments about her appearance during a visit to the legislature. Uh, Staples later resigned from his leadership position with the House Democratic Caucus. In 2016, the House expelled Rep. Jeremy Durham, a Franklin Republican, following an investigation that found he had engaged in misconduct involving 22 women. 
Wow. What the fuck? Uh, uh, Roxanne Gay, by the way, made a comment. She's like, put men in rice. Like, they're broken. Like, put men in rice. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So, yeah, I think it's so great that about six hours after News Channel 5 confronted him, Campbell resigned. Yeah. He just resigned. This next story should be schadenfreude, but this is lovely. Hey, let's run the jingle. Let's do some schadenfreude. Schadenfreude. All right, from Sarah Murray at CNN, the pillow man, Mike Lindell, has been ordered to pay $5 million to an expert who debunked his data related to the 2020 election. Lindell, a purveyor of election conspiracies and pillows, vowed to award the multi-million dollar sum to any cybersecurity expert who could disprove his data. An arbitration panel awarded Robert Ziedman, who has decades in software development experience, a $5 million payout on Wednesday after he sued Lindell over the sum. CNN has obtained arbitration documents, video depositions, including Lindell's deposition. Uh, Quote, based on the foregoing analysis, Mr. Ziedman performed under the contract. That's what the arbitration panel wrote. He proved the data that Lindell provided and and represented reflected information from the November 2020 election unequivocally did not reflect November 2020 election data. Failure to pay Mr. Ziedman the $5 million prize money was a breach of that contract, entitling him to recover. <laughs> <laughs> the decision marks yet another blow to the pillow man's credibility after he publicly touted unproven claims of widespread fraud in the 2020 election. Lindell has also faced defamation suits related to his election claims. Quote, the lawsuit and verdict mark another important moment in the ongoing proof that the 2020 election was legal and valid and the role of cybersecurity in ensuring that integrity. That's Brian Glasser, founder of Bailey and Glasser LLP, who represented Ziedman in the case. Lindell's claim to have 2020 election data has been definitively disproved. In a brief phone interview with CNN, Lindell said this will end up in court and slammed the media and pro- professed the need to get rid of electronic voting machines. Lindell convened a so-called cyber symposium, as we know, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota in 2021, designed to showcase the data he claimed to have obtained that was related to the 2020 election. He invited journalists, politicians and cybersecurity experts to attend. Quote, the symposium was to get the big audience and have all the media there. And they, the cyber guys, saying, yes, this data is from the 2020 election and you better look at how they intruded into our machines and our computers. And that was the whole purpose, he said in a deposition obtained by CNN. He also announced a prove Mike wrong challenge in which anyone could prove his data uh, was unrelated to the 2020 election. They could win five million (laughs) dollars. He did that to get more traction in the media for his election fraud claims. Quote, I thought, well, what if I put up five million dollars out there? Then it would get news, which it did. (laughs) So I got some attention. What a fucking moron. (laughs) Ziedman signed up for the challenge, agreed to its contractual terms, and discovered Lindell's data to be largely nonsensical. Quote, the contest did not require participants to disprove election interference. Thus, the contestants' task was to prove the data presented to them was not valid data from the 2020 election. That's what the panel wrote. The panel was not asked to decide whether China interfered in the election, nor was the panel asked to decide whether Lindell possessed data that proved such interference, or even whether Lindell had election data at all. According to the arbitration panel, quote, the focus of the decision is on the 11 files provided to Mr. Ziedman in the context of the contest rules. The panel's decision ticked through each of the data files provided to Ziedman, determining repeatedly that the data was unrelated to the 2020 election. I mean, it's just so funny. (laughs) Oh, my God. I love it. I love to see it. All right. Another top Republican legal strategist told a room full of GOP donors over the weekend that conservatives must band together to limit voting on college campuses, same-day voter registration and automatic mailing of ballots to registered voters. That's according to a copy of her presentation reviewed by the Washington Post. Cleta Mitchell is Cleta Mitchell, longtime GOP lawyer and fundraiser who worked closely with former President Trump to try and overturn the results of the 2020 election, gave the presentation at the Republican National Committee donor retreat in Nashville on Saturday. The presentation, which had more than 50 slides and was labeled a level playing field for 2024, offered a window into a strategy that seems designed to reduce voter access and turnout among certain groups, including students and those who vote by mail, both of which tend to skew Democratic. Well, Mitchell did not respond to a quest for comment. Shocking. It's unclear whether she delivered the presentation exactly as it was prepared on her PowerPoint slides. But in addition to the presentation, the Post listened to audio 
a portions of the presentation obtained by liberal journalist Lauren Windsor, in which Mitchell discussed limiting campus and early voting. Woohoo, Lauren yeah. Windsor, our friend. I know, I love it. This is a quote. What are these college campus locations? She asked, according to the audio. What is this young people effort that they do? They basically put the polling place next to the student dorm so they just have to roll out of bed, vote, and go back to bed. Yeah, that's exactly how it should be fucking done, by the way. (laughs) Yeah, look, what the fuck is wrong with that? I know. The GOP has not formally endorsed Mitchell's plan, but has worked closely with her since Trump left office. The presentation made clear that at least some key figures within the party remain intent on tightening rules for voting and elections. The persistence of the message as the 2024 vote approaches comes despite the fact that candidates who emphasized Trump's stolen election narrative were repudiated in many key statewide races in 2022 midterms. They lost their ass. Well, Mitchell told her RNC audience that her organization, which is the Election Integrity Network, (laughs) is not about winning campaigns, according to the text of the presentation. But the slides gave little other rationale for why campus or mail voting should be curtailed. At another point in the presentation, she said the nation's electoral systems must be saved, and I quote, for any candidate other than a leftist to have a chance to win in 2024. Mm. At one point in the presentation, Mitchell said uh, she is optimistic that the Virginia Senate will flip to Republican control this year, allowing for the elimination of early voting in the state. And that's according to the audio that the Post reviewed. Mitchell advised Trump and was on the call between Trump and Georgia's Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger in January of 2021 when Trump asked him to find enough votes to overturn the results. She was on that fucking call. <laughs> so I'm going to be, I'd be shocked if she's not in trouble anyway at, with this investigation with Fani. But in her presentation in Nashville, Mitchell focused on campus voting in five states. That was Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, Virginia, and Wisconsin all of which are home to enormous public universities with large in-state student populations. Now, Mitchell also targeted the pre-registration of students, an apparent reference to the practice in some states of allowing 17-year-olds to register ahead of their 18th birthday so that they can vote as soon as they are eligible, which makes total sense. Eligible? Eligible? I know. Okay. Yep. In her presentation, Mitchell also called for the ouster of two Republican elected officials in Maricopa County, who defended President Biden's victory there in the face of Trump's false claims that the election was rigged. And that's County Recorder Stephen uh, Richer and County Supervisor Bill Gates. So she's even going after her own. Anyone that's going to speak up for the truth and all of this stuff, like they're saying the quiet parts out loud. Gen Z, they are coming for you. So if you are listening to this, you better get everyone you know out there to vote because they are trying hard. Yeah. They really, really are. And um, that's why I'm so happy with the Wisconsin result. I think it's going to make things a lot more fair. But they are literally, by in their own words, trying to disqualify or make it more difficult for eligible voters to vote. It's not the we only want to count the legal votes anymore. It's we don't even want to count the legal ones that might vote Democratic. Yep. All right. We'll be right back with the host of the new podcast, Long Shadow. That's Garrett Graff. Uh, You don't want to miss this discussion. Stick around. After the Hey, everybody, you tired of deodorants that just don't cut it? I want to tell you about Lumi. It is my new favorite thing, the whole body deodorant that will change the way you think about odor control. Created by an OBGYN, Lumi is uniquely formulated to be pH balanced and safe to use anywhere on your body. So say goodbye to -to day-to-day odor below the belt with Lumi's clinical proven formula that blocks odor all day and controls it for up to 72 hours. I've been using Lumi now for a while, and I have to say... I'm really, really impressed. What I like most about it is it really does work everywhere on my body. Another unexpected benefit is it doesn't irritate my skin like other deodorants I've tried. Overall, I would highly recommend giving Lumi a try if you're looking for a gentle and effective deodorant. Unlike other deodorants that merely mask odor with fragrance, Lumi is powered by mandelic acid to stop odor before it starts, more like a pre-odorant. With a range of alluring scents like clean tangerine, lavender sage, or toasted coconut, Lumi is the perfect solution for anyone looking for a reliable and long-lasting deodorant for your entire body. And a special offer for listeners, new customers get $5 off a Lumi starter pack with code DAILYBEANS at lumideodorant.com. That equates to over 40% off your starter pack when you visit lumideodorant.com and use code DAILYBEANS. That's a $5 discount off the Lumi starter pack or over 40% off when you go to lumi, L-U-M-E, deodorant.com and use code DAILYBEANS. 
Hey, everybody, welcome back. I'm happy to be joined today by my friend who's a CNN contributor, historian and journalist, Garrett Graff. He is the host of a new seven part limited podcast series called Long Shadow Rise of the American Far Right. Hi, Garrett. Hi. Great to chat with you again. Yeah, I'm so excited to talk to you. It's great to see you again. And I'm really excited about this new podcast uh, because we're, I think, episode two drops this week. Episode one was incredible about Waco. Uh, and, you know, we know that they were, you know, going to host a rally down there. And, and uh, just there's so much subsumed in how we got to January 6th and where we go from here. Talk a little bit about what prompted you to put this series together. Sure. Um, you know, this week is April 19th, the sort of far right's own day of infamy. Um, 30 years ago this spring, the 30th anniversary of the fiery end to the Waco siege at the Branch Davidian compound, where 76 members of that apocalyptic religious sect uh, perished at the end of a lengthy standoff and huge gunfight with federal agents. Um, The largest law enforcement shootout in American history um, kicked off that that um, incident in back in 1993. And my goal with this series was to try to go back and explain how we got here and explain how we got to the moment when the radical far right went from the fringe of the Republican Party to the mainstream. And that's a story that takes place really over 40 years. And it's the story of how a movement that has its roots in the Ku Klux Klan in the 1970s morphs and evolves and reinvents itself into the modern white power, white nationalist movement that we see really power Donald Trump and bring the violence to the steps of the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. And that's, uh, as you know, because you sort of live and cover this story as well, that's not the end of the story. I mean, this is a big part of our daily politics now. It sounds like that this, um, you know, corrosive, racist, anti-Semitic ideology is actually pretty central to understanding the discord intelligence leaks of the last couple of weeks here. And that this is a movement that is alive and well at all levels of our federal government, from local school boards right up to the halls of Congress. Yeah. And and it's getting like it seemed to start. I mean, the things that were, you know, like Trump's been putting out on his truth social thing, a lot of calls for uh, violence. A lot of it's been veiled, but some of it's been pretty overt. And it seems to get incrementally overt as time goes on. I was wondering if you noticed that, too. Like most of it's just, you know, garbage like we won and you know, the deep state and they're out to get me. But sometimes, uh, you know, I remember he put a tweet out just before his arraignment in New York on on the charges and out of the Manhattan DA's office where he actually called on the New York Police Department to revolt. And so you you get these little sort of tinges of more overt language. And it seems like as they push the envelope higher and higher, the language gets more and more overt. But I was wondering if you had a sense of the numbers here, right? Is this a a huge movement on the far right, or is it a very small, loud movement? Do you know what I mean? Is it? Is it? Yeah. Um, and I think the answer is both. And one of the things that we really try to trace out is this very deliberate decision by the extreme right um, over the course of the 1980s and early 1990s to embrace what they call leaderless resistance, which is, you know, something different than the white power movement had done until then, which is to try to establish this arm's length distance between the leaders and the hate speech and the rhetoric and the followers and ideologues and believers who are actually carrying out the violence. And so it allows them to sort of say like, oh, gosh, we we never intended for our 
uh, calls for death and destruction to uh, end in actual violence. We were just saying words out loud and are not responsible for the person who actually then carried out that violence in the streets because we've never met that person. And that this is a very deliberate set of decisions that we trace in the series going back to the early 1980s, the early 1990s, um, sort of specific white power gatherings where they come together and sort of hash out this strategy and, and then begin to push it forward. And it's partly how we're able to tell ourselves this myth that this is not an organized movement. Um, you know, next week's episode focuses on the Oklahoma City bombing, um, which is carried out, of course, on the two year anniversary of the Branch Davidian siege on April 19th, 1995. And, you know, we have for 25 years told ourselves this myth that like Tim McVeigh is a lone wolf and that he carried out this attack, you know, basically by himself with the help of Terry Nichols and Michael Fortier. And that, you know, he carries out the worst domestic terrorism incident in American history, you know, without being part of any organized movement. And that's actually just not true. And you see, when you go back and you look at his path to radicalization, this very, you know, normal set of steps that he goes down with, you know, from being a decorated Gulf War veteran to someone willing to blow up 169 innocent lives in Oklahoma City. And that this is something that we sort of still maintain today, which is you know, I uh, we, we talk about in a future episode, uh, Caesar Sayoc, mm -hmm. who you, you probably remember is the guy who sends, you know, two dozen mail bombs to leading Democratic figures, political pundits, you know, CNN and, uh, you know, Jim Clapper and others. I just wrote that down right oh. here as you oh, were yes. speaking. Yes. I was like, because it reminded me of him. We, well, I call him the CNN bomber. Yep. De Pape, who attacked Paul Pelosi, the shooter who who shot up the FBI field office. Yep. And, you know, all of these warnings from uh, Department of Homeland Security, uh, you know, saying they are now going after individuals who seem susceptible or depressed or alone. You know, the kind of red flags we see when we take our government insider alert training and and that's who they're kind of recruiting uh, to to do these things. And so, yeah, and and it's incremental, like you said, right? Like we, you know, I was watching, if you watch The Handmaid's Tale, you, yeah. you get flashbacks to the before times and you'll see her coming home and saying, hey, honey, I, for some reason now need to get your signature on my birth control prescription. And it's like an instant recognition that, those are the tiny baby steps that push these folks like who you were just talking about, the CNN bomber, to the lengths that they get to, at, you know, uh, the extreme lengths that they get to. But I mean, are, we're seeing it now like over like overflowing into this more overt thing. Yes. And, and, you know, one of the other threads that we follow over 40 years in this podcast is the Turner Diaries, um, which, uh, you know, is this, you know, sort of far right doomsday apocalyptic racist fan fiction that is published by, uh, a, you know, a, a white power leader in 1978 uh, who has broken off from the American Nazi Party because he believes that the American Nazi Party is not actually extreme enough mm. in America and so he goes out, writes his own, um, you know, doomsday novel that becomes really a how to manual that you see the far right follow for the next 40 years. Um, and we talk about this pretty extensively in this week's episode. It comes up in almost every single future episode as well. And, you know, the what's incredible is, you know, without without this is not a spoiler alert, the, the sort of culminating uh, scene of 
the the Turner Diaries is what's called the day of the rope when, uh, you know, sort of white, you know, white separatist groups and, and militias, you know, go out and hang all of the race traders and Jews and journalists and, uh, you know, enemies of the state that they can find. That's literally what they did on January 6th. I mean, they mm-hmm. erected a, a scaffold on the Capitol lawn and chanted, hang Mike Pence. And it was sort of supposed to be its own day of the rope. And that this is not something that lives only in the fantasy of the far right. This is a literal how-to manual that they have been following for 40 years. Yeah. And another uh, through line, I think, that um, is discussed is when we talk about things like the day of the rope is um, a central tenet to white supremacy, which is the great replacement theory. Right. I mean, I know that there were some studies that show a lot of the people who were at January 6th are uh, not super rural red district living folks. They're they're red voters in in purple or blue uh, states who are who have this fear. Talk about the Great Replacement Theory. Yeah. And this was, of course, something that, you know, we were splashed across our our national headlines in Charlottesville, where you had the group come together you know, march with tiki torches through the parks of Charlottesville, chanting, you will not replace us. And there is this very strong underlying, you know, anti-Semitism to a lot of these groups and movements in a way that is really interesting in the modern incarnation, in the way that they sort of joke about their anti-Semitism that, you know, you, you look at the proud boys, which, you know, pretend that they are not a white nationalist group, that they are not an anti-Semitic group, but, you know, they pledge to be Western chauvinists. They pledge that, you know, Western men have created everything that's worth creating in the world. And they have this prank that they try to play where they, you know, try to get people to recite the so-called 14 words, um, you know, this sort of defining hate filled uh, mantra against uh, Jewish people as a joke that they, you know, basically try to get people to record videos of themselves saying the 14 words um, and posting online and, you know, got folks like Roger Stone to do it. And you sort of see these crossovers between, you know, these these street gangs and the Republican Party establishment in ways that are really troubling and worrisome. Yeah. And something else your podcast made me think of and, and reflect back on was the video, the short movie that um, Donald Trump played on January 6th at the Ellipse and the incredible amount of anti-Semitic propaganda I mean, it looked straight out of uh, a movie that we would watch about, you know, Nazi Germany. The themes and the colors and the use of cinematography and the fear, uh, it was all present in that short film that he played at the Ellipse before he, you know, incited the mob to go attack the Capitol. And so, yeah, I mean, we see it everywhere now. Yeah. And and that is a lot of what. I think it's interesting in, in tracing back these 40 year roots um, as we do in the, the, the podcast, because what you begin to understand is all of these things that, you know, are basically dog whistles of one kind or another that are not new and only subtle if you don't know what you're looking for. Um, and these messages of hate that are very much embedded in the modern Republican Party in ways that 20, 30, 40 years ago, this was the sort of unthinkable fringe of the Republican Party. And today it is the mainstream uh, and core of the party establishment. Yeah. I mean, I remember being a teenager in the late 80s or early 90s in Arizona, which was a hotbed of uh, white power, white supremacy, Nazi movement during that time. And there were leaders like a guy named War Baby, who, you know, is on the Anti-Defamation League's uh, website as one of the most wanted guys. And he led 
gangs, groups of of Nazis, white supremacists. We just called them Nazis. And then there was the attacks on the Mosley brothers and and the mm-hmm. fire bombings. And that all went on in within the group of people that I was hanging. I was a I was in Sharp, which was the skinheads against racial prejudice. And and we would basically our job was to go to concerts like punk shows and and stand guard and protect people from Nazis who would come in in packs. And that was just the very early beginnings of it. And it seemed like such a fringe movement. And, you know, you then you get later on into stuff like American History X, the film there, and it's growing. And now we have new tools for them to use. And I know you, you discussed that as well. Talk a little bit about the almost exponential rise, um, you know, due to a lot of these online platforms. Yeah. And, and what you see is that the far right has been a uniquely early and uniquely creative leader in embracing new technologies, um, going back basically to the online bulletin board stage. And that, mm-hmm. you know, some of the oldest websites uh, still on the web today are websites like Stormfront that are, you know, the white power, uh, you know, central organizing sites. And that these, the movement has really embraced how these organizing technologies help them bring together disparate sets of believers and recruit new ideologues uh, across the country. And that it, you know, coming back to this idea of leaderless resistance, that in some ways, it allows them to even more fully embrace how they don't have to be directly involved in the violence that they create. Um, and that we see that in things like the Charleston church shooting, where there are the Dylan Roof, the, the shooter in that uh, horrific massacre it is, you know, radicalized through, you know, quote, doing his own research and going to these hate filled websites and looking at their cases for, you know, great replacement theory for um, these other conspiracies, these other hate filled ideas. And, um, you know, that he is inspired to action by, you know, these websites, even though there's no ability there's no trace that he ever actually contacted any of them. Yeah. Uh, and I, I mean, we just <laughs> it it just keeps going on and on. Um, and, and then, you know, I'm going to ask you and maybe we should just wait until the uh, later episodes of the series. But what, what do we do? What do we do? I don't know that we I don't know that there are easy paths out of this. And, you know, I think part of that answer is you know, very aggressive prosecution. I mean, a big part of this story over the last 40 years is the U.S. government continually underestimating how serious this threat is, continuing to not prosecute it vigorously, screwing up a lot of prosecutions along the way. And that it, you know, some level of this is about imposing costs on these people who are the top of the hate pyramid. And, you know, by the way, I would put Fox News right up there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in probably some very small way, a $787 million judgment in the Dominion lawsuit will help impose a little bit of a cost, but clearly not going to radically change Fox News's direction. But, uh, you know, I think the bigger... Uh, the bigger choice that we have to make as a nation is does this hate have a place in our politics? And that is a decision that, you know, we make election by election, vote by vote, you know, up and down the ticket. And, you know, what is different about this white nationalist movement, these, you know, wild and awful conspiracy theories that permeate the Republican Party today is that 40 years ago, this was not something that had a place in our politics. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even, you know, 30 years ago, you know, the campaigns of someone like uh, David Duke were, you know, big and controversial. And uh, now, 
you know, we see ourselves electing, you know, not just one or two, but, uh, you know, a dozen or two dozen of these believers to Congress. Yeah, agreed. And, you know, I think to combat the Fox News disinformation machine deterrence, you know, they say money is accountability when when they got their uh, lawsuit there. I don't know. I think I would have liked to have seen an apology, but who really is going to listen to that? You know, it's it's sort of, you know, forcing them to go on air and tell them that they lied about things, I think may have helped a little bit in certain minds, but probably not that much. And then, you know, of course, we have deterrence from the Department of Justice charging a thousand. And we're probably looking at 2000 before it's all over. People boots on the ground who attacked the Capitol. And I think that that sort of deterrence, perhaps, and, you know, we'll never truly know but might have led to the complete lack of turnout, you know, during Trump, the search at Mar-a-Lago or during his arrest. Right. At, uh, th- and so I like to I like to think that. And then hopefully we've got a special counsel who will hold the people higher up accountable and maybe that will be a deterrence. But, I, you know, there's 12 different guardrails that hold up this democracy and they all have to be firing for, for that to work. But it's also uh, citizen journalists and people like you putting out series like this that are that are just so important to 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 this particular movement to get the word out there. So I thank you so much for creating this podcast series. Everybody, episode one called Waco is out and episode two called Ruby Ridge just dropped this week. Everybody, please find it, listen to it wherever you get your podcast. It'll be a seven part limited series. Uh, CNN contributor, historian, journalist, Garrett Graff, thank you for joining me today. Thanks so much. The, the podcast is Long Shadow Rise of the American Far Right. Oh, I probably should have said that. <laughs> I had it all prepared in my head. Yeah. And I uh, that's I guess just where we're at. Long shadow. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Rise of the American far right. It's such an important piece of work and piece of media. Right. So thank you again. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back with the good. Top tech companies like Intel have a secret to their success. They get the best talent, reliable infrastructure and save on costs by expanding in Ohio. The new Silicon Heartland. Learn how your business can succeed in Ohio. Visit successinohio.com. Look around this car and think of all the hot, crispy McDonald's fries that have slipped out of your fingers after you couldn't resist grabbing them. Thank you, Fallen Fries. Give your fingers another chance ordering ahead on the McDonald's app. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. Mobile order and paid participating McDonald's. This message is provided by Beringer Engelheim. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or IPF, is one of the more common forms of progressive fibrosing interstitial lung diseases with symptoms including breathlessness during activity, a dry and persistent cough, chest discomfort, fatigue, and weakness. There are more than 200 lung disorders that can lead to pulmonary fibrosis, an irreversible scarring of lungs that can negatively impact lung function, quality of life, and may become life-threatening. While approved treatments for people living with these diseases can help slow disease progression, new therapies are needed to help potentially stop progression. Fortunately, there is new research underway to assess the safety and efficacy of an investigational treatment in patients with IPF and other progressive ILDs. This is part of Beringer Ingelheim's Phase 3 Global Global Fibronir program. To learn more about Fibronir and eligibility requirements, visit fibronir-ipf.longboat.com and fibronir-ild.longboat.com. How did we get here? A moment when the fringe has overrun the mainstream, when conspiracy theorists roam the halls of Congress, when politics have turned to violence in the streets. I'm Garrett Graff. On my podcast, Long Shadow, I'm exploring the decades-long rise of the modern far-right movement and the governmental failures that fueled its fire. How the movement was sparked by a deadly fiasco at Waco, Texas. This fire is racing out of control, black smoke. Fed by decades of conspiratorial thinking. Death to the New World Order! And ultimately led to a riot on the steps of the U.S. Capitol. We have a breach of the Capitol! Breach of the Capitol! How did America get the far right so wrong? And what will it take now to get it right? From Longlead and Campside Media, it's Long Shadow, Rise of the American Far Right. News. Everybody, welcome back. It's time for the good news. Near. 
good news, good news. And if you have any good news, confessions, corrections, anything you want to send to us, a shout out to a loved one, a local business in your area you want to support, would be stories, what the mutt, whatever, pod pet pics, anything, send them to us at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. Oh, oh, look, what the heck wine? Oh, boy, there is no chance in hell I'm going to be able to participate in this because I don't, <laughs> I, I think I'd, I'd know a Clydesdale if I saw one and that's about it. All right. Hi, AG and DG. This is Kelly, uh, pronoun she and her. Here's my horse, Gina, for what the heck wine. She isn't one of the breeds you mentioned, but I bet you can guess. My son and I are looking forward to seeing Dana in Albuquerque. We've what? got tickets. Yes, Woo! Kelly, that's awesome. Please, please. There's going to be, I don't know what tickets you got, but just find me. If you're not part of the meet and greet, just be like Dana <laughs> said, I could come say hi. All right. I'm going to go ahead and say it. This is a paint or a pinto, also known maybe as an Appaloosa. Mm. Um, we'll see. Let's scroll down. Appaloosa. Look at you. (laughs) I am a horse person. Yay, I did it. Uh, All right. Um, Go ahead and take the next one. I will. This is from Caroline. Pronouns she and her. Hello, A.G. and Dana, my beautiful (laughs) gumminatis. All right. I like it. Thank you for all you do. Gummies for 420, I guess. Oh, that's cute. Your podcast is at the top of my daily gotta get to's. I'm on East Coast Transplant from Connecticut, now living in Columbus, Ohio, surrounded by like-minded friends, yet still adrift in a sea of blue known as rural, excuse me, rural Ohio. I think she means a sea of red. Yeah, I think so too, unfortunately. Thanks for helping us keep our sanity in these crazy times. Attached is a pic of Kiwi, a mispronounced version of Kima from The Wire. Do you watch The Wire? No, I don't. Okay. I hope I said that right. On a weighted blanket placed in an open space, thus confirming the theory cats love square spaces. Mm-hmm. Who knows why? Mm. Keeping it up and all you do. Keep it up, I think that is. Uh, your buddy in Columbus, Caroline. P.S. I'm contributing on the subject of what the mutt, but haven't been able to get another dog after losing my fur baby, Layla. Um, my shitty little white dog I love so much. Oh, my oh. God. Oh, look at the cat on the square and look at the Eames lounger in the background and the congas. Very cool. I'm intrigued by Caroline. Indeed. Thank you so much. What a beautiful cat. All right. Next up from Sally G. Pronouns she and her. Greetings. Uh, Grumptionous goddesses. Gumptionous. I'm like grumptionous. Am I grumpy? Gumptionous goddesses. I have a couple of shout outs. Annie is a mom to a pair of awesome young people, wife to her longtime best friend, and one of the stellar employees at Found Underground in Louisville, Colorado, I believe. Found Underground is an upscale clothing resale shop that is also extremely welcoming uh, in the community. It's a community hub. It's one of the places I went to share a tearful hug of what the fuck and loving support after Donster the Monster came lumbering into our collective life in 2016. These people and places hold the world together, I'm telling you. Nice. For pet tax, yeah, right? Uh, I submit two favorite shots of Neil and Henry, an inspiring friend, Annie's furry four-leggeds, uh, from whom I get pretty much daily contact, a daily contact high through her IG posts at the Watts O L A K. So the Watts W A T T S O L A K. Oh look, Wattslack. No idea. Oh my gosh. Oh, look at the squirrel watching. Cute. So adorable. Thank you for that. And you're right, man. Those places like. When some disaster happens and you're like, uh, this is where I need to go to be around my people. Yeah. Those are the important places. I agree. All right. This one's from Anonymous Pronouns She and Her. Hello, Leguminati. I'm one of the many loyal Democrats abroad listeners uh, around the globe. And I'd like to ask a favor, please. Is there any chance you could change your podcast closer to emphasize that 2023 isn't an off year? It's a down ballot year. Nice. Vote blue over Q and bring someone with you even in 2023. Sorry, no rhyming. Hopefully you can think of something more clever if you're able to do this. There are elections in close to 40 states this year, statewide to municipal. It's key that blue voters vote every opportunity we're given. 2023 elections will set the stage for 2024. Wisconsin was a prime example. As well, a reminder or news to anyone who's listening. There are millions of Americans living outside the U.S. and our votes make a difference. If you have a friend, family member, colleague, who's living or studying abroad, please send them to votefromabroad.org to register and request their ballots. Yes, please. For pet tax, sorry, know what the mutt picks do to allergies in the house. Instead, I offer you a pick of Livy, our sweet little Russian dwarf hamster 
who keeps me company at my desk. Thank you both for all you do and for providing daily doses of sanity and laughter to keep us all going. Who knew dwarf hamsters were a thing? Look at the baby face. Oh, my goodness. But yeah, Anonymous, that's why I keep doing the Vote Blue over Q even in 2023, um, because there's always elections, you know? Always. I love it. But thank you for the reminder. We need them. Mm -hmm, Definitely. Thank you for that so much. And thank you for the little ball, the little hamster and the little hamster ball. All right. Next up from Ruth, pronoun she and her. Hi, AG and Dana. Here's a shot of me, my sister, Margaret, and her basset hound, Pinky, at the annual basset waddle. Down the boardwalk in Ocean City, New Jersey last weekend, there's an annual Bassett Waddle. How did I not know this? And we're posing in front of an orange Dodge Charger driven by Bo and Luke Duke of the problematic Dukes of Hazard. It was fun to see a relic of our past at the event. Uh, we and our three brothers tuned in to watch the car chase uh, the car chases faithfully every week, then reenacted them in the backyard with our bikes. Dude, so did me. So did me. I wasn't going to say anything. You are not. <laughs> you are not editing that out. No. Nope. And I know my microphone got hot. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, producers. But no. Nope, so did her. So did her. <laughs> so did we. <laughs> and I always had to be Daisy, and I hated that because I had to drive her Jeep, oh my the Dixie, God. and I wanted to drive the generally. But Daisy Duke was my role model. Ruth says until those feminism classes in college. <laughs> oh my God. Bassett fans can check out the host and uh, beneficiary of the event, tristatebassets.org. That's a rescue association for those low-riding lovelies. Marg, or Marge probably, adopted award-winning Pinky from a show dog breeding farm after she had to have a cesarean section, so she wasn't useful to them anymore. Oh, she is a, a true and mighty bitch, a life coach, a much more worthy role model than Daisy Duke. We worship her. Oh, look. Oh, my God. So good. <gasps> oh, you guys look amazing. I know. Is that Roscoe's car with flash on top right next to it? Oh, my God. Is it? It has to be. because That's... It's, a... <gasps> it's so and that... f- It's just so funny because I think we talked about how problematic this show is now. Yeah. <laughs> We did yesterday, right? Yeah. And I, then I think over to the left, I think that's either Cletus or Enos's car. Oh, my goodness. Enos, by the way, is a really weird name. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's Roscoe's patrol car there with Flash on top. Yeah. And, and that's now it makes sense why the Dukes of Hazard stuff is at the Basset Hound Waddle, because Roscoe P. Coltrane had a Basset Hound. Named Flash. Flash. Yep. All makes sense. All right. This is from Tony, pronounced he and him. Dear Beanie Overlords. <laughs> I took my big flag to the east side of Cleveland Saturday to join a protest against the, oh, wow, antediluvian Antediluvian. casmeric ruling. Oh, uh, antediluvian casmeric ruling. Casmeric, thank you. Uh, Antediluvian casmeric ruling. Uh, It took place at a Walgreens because they decided to stop selling, uh, uh, God, Stephanie Miller said this this morning. Mephipristone. Mephipristone, thank you. Mm -hmm. In spite of it still being legal in Ohio. This time I flew a green and black abortionist healthcare flag below the American flag. I love this guy. There are only about 50 of us, but we made up for small numbers with our enthusiasm. After a few speeches by local politicians and the leader of Cleveland Women's March, many of the protesters sat down in the middle of Chester Avenue for a while, which is probably not pronounced Chester because why would it be? (laughs) A police helicopter had been circling overhead (laughs) the whole time, but the cops on the ground were pretty chill for, for once. They blocked traffic quickly, so there were only a few cars pushing through at first. The police left us alone and didn't attempt to move us. After 20 minutes or so, we got up and cleared the street. The one very cool thing that happened was when a youngish man came up to me and asked if I'd listen to the Daily (gasps) Beans. I said that I did. And he then said, well, you must be Tony then. What? That's fucking awesome. I laughed and I said I was indeed. He said that the chances of there being more than one guy in overalls out there with a (laughs) giant flag were slim. (laughs) We talked a bit about the pod and then went on our ways, vowing to see each other again as soon as there will always excuse me, there will always be more protests and rallies in the near future. Last fall, I was in D.C. to protest the overturning of Roe v. Wade, and I saw a woman with a yellow flag with a purple circle on it over her shoulders. I asked her what it represented, and she told me it was the intersex pride flag. Mm. Um, She told me how she was intersex at birth and assigned male. Now, I just want to interject here, by the way, that there are a lot of intersex population. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Uh, do, 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 do. She told me she was intersex at birth and assigned male. She was, in fact, female. She had a conversation about her experiences and my own trans kids. We promised to look out for each other the next rally. We did not connect at the January rally in D.C. to mark the 50th anniversary of Roe, but we did meet at the Trans Day of Awareness last month. Tony, you're just fucking awesome. All right. She said she had a present for me and pulled a brand new intersex pride flag out of her backpack. I had no zip ties with me, so I could not put up my my flagpole right then. But when I got home, I put it on the pole in front of my house with my transgender pride flag. I sent her a pic on Instagram and she sent back, aw, yay, it looks great. Until next time, all my love. Tony, one, right? I just, you're just, you're just goodness. Your goodness, please be careful. Your safety is most important to us. But the fact that you still have the courage every time one of this happens, and not just you're not just out there, you're waving a giant flag, bringing attention to yourself, standing up in the face of evil. And I just could not love you more. The chances of there being more than one guy in overalls out there with a giant <laughs> flag were slim. I know. You must be Tony then. How fucking cool. I know. Uh, if you're that other Daily Beans listener, write in. Tell us about your experience meeting Tony. Totally. Uh, I would love to hear about it. Tony's becoming a protest celebrity. I know. All right. Well, it's Friday. We don't have a happy hour tonight, uh, but you will get the Daily Beans weekly wrap up unedited raw from me probably Saturday night. And uh, you will also get the cleanup on L45 bonus with Pete if you're a $2 cleanup patron. Uh, and, uh, of course, Jack on Sunday. Yeah, absolutely. Which is, we gotta, we're going to talk about the Epstein stuff. Oh, so good. I'll be back in your ears Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday before I leave. Um, but I'm looking forward to it. Yep. And then I'll carry us through the rest of that week. And then we are dark the following week, the week of May 1st. We uh, will not have any shows, although I might record some stuff. But the, hey, that means, right, that's the last week that the Fonnie Willis grand jury is impaneled before Ooh. they swear in a new one. So she's going to use this grand jury to issue indictments. What well, might be the week? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It always happens when we're on vacation. All right, everybody. We will be back in your ears over the weekend and on Monday. Until then, please take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet. Take care of your mental health. Vote blue over Q. And take everyone with you, even in 2023. <laughs> even in the odd years. There are down ballot years. Uh, I've been AG. And I've been DG. And that's the beans. The Daily Beans is written and executive produced by Allison Gill with additional research and reporting by Dana Goldberg. Sound design and editing is by Desiree McFarlane with art and web design by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. Music for The Daily Beans is written and performed by They Might Be Giants and the show is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, please visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media. Hi, I'm Harry Littman, host of Talking Feds, a roundtable that brings together prominent figures from government law and journalism for a dynamic discussion of the most important topics of the day. Each Monday, I'm joined by a slate of Feds favorites and new voices to break down the headlines and give the insider's view of what's going on in Washington and beyond, plus sidebars explaining important legal concepts read by your favorite celebrities. Find Talking Feds wherever you get your podcasts. Look around this car and think of all the hot, crispy McDonald's fries that have slipped out of your fingers after you couldn't resist grabbing them. Thank you, Fallen Fries. Give your fingers another chance ordering ahead on the McDonald's app. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Mobile order and paid participating McDonald's.